everybody. Sam with Subterranean Annihilation here. Um, I got Tommy Wall from Tomb Warden, Brain Pan, Secular Media, and much more. What's up, Tommy? How you doing? Sam. So you're, in my hum humble opinion, you're kind of like a DC punk metal scene heavyweight. Uh, thanks for coming to our channel and doing this. Oh, man, thank you for having me. It's awesome that you're doing this, man. I'm loving the interviews. Got to hear Tyler and Hallucination Realize and all that stuff. Yeah, it's been going good so far. So first, tell me a backstory about yourself from growing up to when you first became immersed in the underground music scene. I grew up in the uh, northern Virginia part of, like, the D.C. area. So, like, Arlington and Falls Church recently, you know, if you're familiar with it at all. Yeah. But uh started listening to metal, I guess, like, new metal, <laughs> like, corn and stuff when I was, like, eight or nine. I had a cousin. My, my dad's from Long Island, so my cousins out there would just, like, give me corn records when I was, like, listening to Blink-182 and shit like that. <laughs> Same. Um, from there... Yeah, like, came across Slayer through, like, an MTV website or something like that, and just off the deep end from there. Yeah, and I started going to shows probably when I was, like, 13 or 14, going to, like, 930 Club and Jacks mainly, and then DIY stuff when I was, like, it was kind of late bloomer in, like, a, in terms of DIY, like, 17, 18. Yeah, same here, probably even later. I didn't even know there was an underground scene until I was in my 20s. I mean, I had heard about it, but it was all, like, too weird. Like, I know the Jacks crowd, like, some old heads that I still see to these to this day, they would talk about, like, uh, brutal death metal shit, like, shit that I love now. But at the time, I was like, damn, man, I just like Anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> what what band would you say made you pick up a guitar and want, want, want to start playing music? To be honest, it was, like, Korn, like, when I was, uh, what, what was it, like, 9, 10, maybe 11? Like, it was actually, I tried to do bass first, and uh, that's actually where... I kind of got most of my musical knowledge is through bass, but it was, you know, watching some porn video uh, where the bass is fieldy was like holding his bass up and like hitting the shit out of it with his hand. I later realized that that sounds terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> just like watching him do it, it was like, dude, like you barely, you can barely play bass. It sounds pretty bad, but <laughs> it was cool. shit to see. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so I picked it up from there. Then um, my mom's Peruvian. So we'd go visit Lima a lot uh, when I was a kid and my uncle like built his own drum set and like had basses and guitars everything is knockoff pirated like crazy um but he had a bass so he let me mess around with it a bunch and I was learning I forget if it was like Led Zeppelin or Rage Against the Machine some some like groovier type yeah. stuff like that so he he showed me some shit like that and uh, he was huge into Rush so he was like a G on the drums hell yeah <laughs> And so that's where I got most of that from, like 11 years old, started playing. Honestly, that's a good way to start. Um, so before we get into all your bands, and there's a lot of bands, you also book shows with your promotion company, Crowbars Up. How did you get started as a promoter? Because uh, no one else would do it. Yeah. I mean, um, at the time, I was in my, probably my first like real band, uh, Narrow Grave, we were, like, me and Jordo, my partner, who was a singer for Narrow Grave, um, we were just hanging out with uh, Hasfan, and um, I forget what show it was, but it came up that that band Homewrecker from Ohio needed oh, yeah. a show, but him and uh, Chris Moore were too busy, and they were, like, the big guys to go to, obviously. So I was like, fuck it, man, I got extra money. I'm not, I'm not hurting for anything. I was living with my parents at the time, so I didn't have to pay rent. And he had a good job too. So we were just like, we have time, we can find a place. Let's, I guess we just pay their guarantee and hope it happens. Yeah. And it worked out. And it was actually, we put we put that show on at a 13th Street house. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Oh, no, you played it. I remember Amora playing that. I, th I thought it was 16th Street. Uh, I, 16th I Street, yeah, 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 I can get that. Yeah. No, you're right, it was 16th Street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing track of the day. Like, it's all the 14th, 13th through 16th Street. That's where all the shit yeah. happens in I wish it did. Yeah, that was a fun uh, show. So, yeah. I mean, like, the home record thing was sick. Blood Incantation ended up playing there. Two more than played that show, um, like, months later. And in general, like, that's how we ended up booking there. And then it kind of, I like our position where it was, like, bands that are, like, on the road coming up, not necessarily huge, like Hassan would take on, and not necessarily, uh, like, I don't know. We, we kind of, we kind of, 
catered towards like the heavier style of shit that wasn't like total Hesher or total punk, right? We were like, we kind of nestled into the grind power violence area in uh, DC. So it's been, it's been all right. I mean, it's been way less active recently. I mean, this year we didn't have much on the books in, in general, but even before the virus, but now yeah. it's dead. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it can be a very stressful and thankless job sometimes. What would you say makes it all worth it? Oh, uh, when there's like, like when the bands have a good time, to be honest, like I, I want to see the audience like having a good time. And that also is important, obviously. But when like the bands show up and then they say like, we never knew DC was like, oh, now everyone kind of has, thanks to Chris Moore and Hassan uh-huh. and I guess to some extent me. And then like the new crop, like Danny and uh, Lauren, uh, the new promoters that are in town, I think they're doing a good job too. Uh, like now DC is kind of a spot, which is nice, but I was starting to promote right when that was starting to change. So people were still coming up to me going like, I had no idea DC could be a viable spot and that kind of shit, you know, at least for like metal stuff. And, you know, there, it was like, uh, like, uh, what's the name? It was Simon. He was putting stuff on for a long time. And he actually did, he laid the groundwork for a lot of it, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And that's where I kind of took off. If you remember Midnight Eye and Simon Callahan, Simon Cohen, depending on how you know him. Like, but he was a real shredded dude. And he, I think he worked at the, or he didn't work there, but he booked at the Corpse Fortress a bunch. And that was the spot that ended right before I came back because I lived in New York for four years. Yeah, so like that's the kind of foundation we were working with, and I liked it when bands would like start to notice they there's like these guys know what's up. We treat them like they say we treat them well, <laughs> yeah. and they say they have a good time, and they try and come back. So as long as they're interested in coming back, then I'm happy. And there's nothing like word of mouth to help spread your name, or just to you know the bands tell other bands that hey this guy showed us a good time. Um, I think that's probably the best way to get your promotion business out there other than the, you know, email and networking stuff. Yeah, man, that's honestly, it's like almost the only way. Like having an email there, I got to be honest, I think I've booked two bands from emails in like the four or five years we've been doing it. It's like everyone else has been like, hey, this guy told me to talk to you about this. What do you think of my band? And usually the band's pretty good. Tell me about the coolest shows that you've ever booked. Both to me, I didn't even think about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the one that comes to mind is just Moisturizer when they played, I think it was last March. Yeah, I guess it was a year ago. Damn. But that was Ixius's first show also when um, Mo from Mind is Prison was doing vocals for them. So just seeing him perform without a guitar in his hand one was crazy. And, you know, Ixius rips. Oh, so yeah, they're awesome. Seeing them with the Mind is Prison connection. Followed by, or Needle opened, no, Ixius opened because it was their first show, then it was Needle, then Moisturizer, then Two More and played that one, just because if I can just put one of my bands on, as much as I used to hate doing that now, it's just like, I don't have to ask another person. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, like, it's not an ego trip, it's like, I really just don't want to wait for nine people to tell me no. No, I, yeah, I, I understand that, it's just, it's like so yeah. much easier that way. Um, That's right. a fucking awesome lineup, by the way. And like, and like, I know Mike was worried about it, but we were all like, like people were moving so much. Like, dude, we were all staring at you guys playing. You guys are so fucking good. <laughs> like, they're so <laughs> tight. And it's like, I can't, I don't want to move because I don't want to miss anything. So let's talk about Tomb Warden. How did Tomb Warden form? That was like, so, like, that was like, what, two, 2016, 2015, something like that. Um, I just, I've been playing grindcore in my, my room in uh, New York for a while. And never really went anywhere when I was living up there. But then I moved back to Virginia and was hanging out with, like, all the narrow grave dudes. And at the time, I think, my good buddy Bennett and our drummer just left the band. So we didn't have a drummer for a minute. So it was just a lot of downtime. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Around the same time, Brain Pan formed. But I was like, I want something a little more death metal-y, grindcore-ish stuff to happen so i started writing a bunch of two worn songs pretty much the same exact time i started writing brain pan songs um and then john was in richmond at the time he just moved there and he was in narrow grave as well and he told me about uh, this drummer paul who is from chantilly virginia which is like 20 minutes down 66 from where i was living at the time and 
he said he could blast. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know anyone who can do blast around here that isn't in like a million bands or, yeah. you know, the same old, same old. And the dude could blast, so he was really, he's really into slam and death metal, which isn't necessarily, well, not, the slam isn't necessarily my thing, but uh, death metal, of course, we got, we got along really well with that. So I met him, we just hung out a bit and started playing, and it didn't start off like what it kind of is known for now, which is like, I have like this guitar rig that, and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but everyone always kind of comes up and says like, dude, how are you doing that? Your tone is whatever, X, Y, Z. So it didn't start off like that. I actually, John was supposed to be a bassist for the band and do vocals, like a uh, deicide style kind of. Oh yeah. And, uh, but then he like broke his wrist in a fight, like the day that he was supposed to try out. Oh shit, I think I, just, I remember that. Yeah, it was it was a rough fight for him, but uh, he still he came up and did vocals anyway. We were like, "Fuck it, man, we'll just do this." We played. Me and Paul played a show, like I think that was in June of like 2016 or something, with Endorphins Lost. And at that point, I noticed. Wait a minute, I have to do vocals. I don't think I've ever practiced this. Like I noticed <laughs> at the show <laughs> that, like, wait a minute, I have to do. Like I forgot about this. So. I did it, and it was probably rough. People said they liked it. I don't know. And then John joined up. I forget what show it was. He joined up after that. All that all that stuff happened, and then I think it was a DOC show with Multi Cult and Coxcar. That yeah, was pretty fucking sick. Well, yeah. So that's generally what happened. It was just us, me having spare riffs, trying to write death metal, worshiping Bolt Thrower, but also wanting to do blast beats and stuff. So, fuck yeah. Um. In just four years, you've put out eight releases, toured, and played countless local gigs. Uh, with you being so so busy yourself and people kind of living far away, what makes this project so productive? Uh, well, like, the way I write and, like, just my job. So I'm a guitar teacher, and I teach at, like, four or five places. I can't I actually lost track. Um, so I'm always playing music. The hours are pretty, you know maneuverable because i can like cancel a lesson if i really need or if someone cancels a lesson we can make it up some other time you know xyz whatever um so i have a lot of downtime and even then when i'm like teaching in a building uh i have a guitar in my hands like all the time so like if there's a half hour between three hours of lessons half hour break then like four more hours of lessons or something like that i have that half hour to just have a guitar in my hands so i can write riffs whenever i feel like it pretty much and I got a degree in jazz bass performance, so I can actually write down music, which as, you know, whatever about the academic aspect of it, it is pretty helpful to write down and understand, like, an idea that I have all of a sudden, and then, like, two months later, I can just look at it. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it helps you remember it. Yeah. So, I mean, like, and I write all the shit down and then read it back to myself later and try it out with Paul and see what works, what doesn't. Uh, I got like 160, two more tracks written down. Holy shit. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're not all good. And thank you most of them probably aren't. But there's probably like 80 usable ones. Well, um, any plans on using those for a full length album? I have a plan, actually. Uh, this, this year we were supposed to start, well, in September, the plan was to start writing. Or, well, writing as in learning like 20 songs or something like that uh -huh. for a full length. But uh, since I'm committing a tour in July on the West Coast, but that all kind of went to hell. So <laughs> yeah, now we kind of have to figure out what's the next move. But, you know, we're kind of taking it easy right now since there was a lot of work going into all these plans that got, like, decimated. So we're all like, all right, we'll not worry about it until this all blows over. So, But there's, there's definitely plans for a full length. That was kind of the next move after the West Coast tour. I got gotcha. you. Um, so going back to your gear, you sound crushing live for just mm -hmm. one guitar player. Um, and I know there's probably some gearheads listening. So can you describe your setup? With pleasure. Uh, so where do I start, I guess? So the guitars I use, I was for, I'm going back to it, but I had this Gibson SG special with what's called the Screaming Demon pickup, which is a George Lynch from Dokken. It's his custom pickup. So it's passive. And but it's really, really hot. Like it's not hot, but it is. I don't know. It's got some, it's got crazy definition. And I think that's a huge part of it. 
because a lot of guys use like those really hot pickups and then they kind of distort too much so you can't really tell what's going on you lose definition so i think that's pretty huge for what i do because i despite being as big as i do sound you can still tell what i'm playing i think yeah so um that's gonna be that's pretty important i'm also using um developing nations uh guitar companies uh nihilist pickup in my iceman which i used recently and it is legitimately the hottest pickup i think my like my buddy who put it in who installed it for me said like this is like five thousand and i figure what the what the rating is hertz something like that uh-huh. but it's five thousand more than the hottest pickup he's ever seen so <laughs> it's pretty fucking hot yeah. Uh, so if you can, and they're like ninety bucks. If you can get a nihilist pickup from Developing Nations Guitars, do it. They're fucking awesome. So in terms of pickups, it's those two, and I think that's that's a big deal with that. And then, so the actual pedal chain is a little crazy. Uh, I have an A B C Y setup. So instead of just you know the two channels, I have three channels going out. One goes directly into this uh, VH140. You know the suffocation dying fetus. I think Asuk even used it, but, you know, like the death metal head, so solid state. And then um, I have another, I forget which channel, it goes into an OCD that goes into a PV Butcher, so like a JCM 800 style, you know, pretty high gain, but not all the way high. And then the overdrive just kind of pushes it into like the crushing territory. So I have, so the way I look at it is my J, that um, the PV Butcher is like the low end of the guitar uh-huh. the vh 140 is like the high end of the guitar so that one's more trebly my low is like at 10 on the butcher for instance so it's it's kind of like the bass guitar yeah and then i have an actual bass channel <laughs> also and that one it goes through um a sanford and sunny bluebeard pedal which is like was pretty hard to come by but nowadays um robo pedals out of baltimore they've taken over manufacturing of the Bluebeard, so I highly recommend you try and grab one if anyone listening here wants something huge sounding. Bluebeards, get them. <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, that thing. That's what like Ilsa uses. That's what Genocide Pact uses. It's a DC. Like I was really proud to have one. Uh, it's like a DC secret, but they're fucking huge. Uh, so that's my grip there. Then I have like a little bass booster. It's, a, it's called a Bifet Boost. It's DOD. That's like forty five bucks. They're pretty good if you want like extra booty on any of your like riffs never a bad thing into a tuner yeah uh and it goes into a tuner and then that goes into um a gk 700 rb which uh the 800 rb is what i like i was we played a show brain pan play a show with cloud rat and rorick was using that for his bass channel i think it was an 800 rb and like i just took a picture of it and be like this is what i'm going to use because <laughs> that <laughs> shit was amazing so yeah, and then you tune all of that to A, A standard. <laughs> well, goddamn. Like, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully someone wrote that down. I guess if they're trying to steal my secrets. <laughs> right on. So Brain Pan, by the way, mm-hmm. awesome name for a band. Uh, who who is in that project, and how long have you been around? So that one is my buddy Pat Trainer, who used to run Australia Pithecus Records. A kind of, I'd say, indefinite hiatus. Um, then it's also Rob Moore, who used to be in that band, Salome, and Three Faces of Eve. And so it's fucking huge for me to be playing with him. He's kind of like a local hero. has become a really good friend. And this drummer, his name's Wendell. He's a good buddy nowadays, obviously, like really good friend. Uh, but he's from Mexico. He played in this vegan straight edge band. I don't know if they were vegan, actually. Uh, Die Young in Texas. Then he moved around the country and ended up in D.C. And uh, Hassan actually kind of put us in contact because Pat and Rob were friends with Hassan before I was friends with Hassan. So it all kind of connected. And I think we started in like early 2016, maybe late 2015. Same same time same time around. Uh, Two Morn started. Fuck yeah! The uh, the Facebook description I like this. It calls it sci fi. Does that mean science fiction power violence? Oh, very much so, yes. <laughs> awesome. I'd say that yeah, sets man. y'all apart from most bands of that type. What inspires this project musically and lyrically? It's all Pat, and I don't want to speak for him, but I know he's pretty into hard sci-fi. So there's, like, actual scientific, like, theories and stuff like that that I think he's pretty well read on. I 
don't even want to embarrass myself trying to explain it. <laughs> but there's like chaos theory and all that kind of shit. I'm assuming, you know, we have some songs about like the composition of neutrons and like how splitting an a- atom happens or some shit. I don't know. But <laughs> and then of course there's always like Simpsons references and a bunch of other like goofy shit, like talking about how much it sucks to work in an office. I wouldn't know, but he hates it. So <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, man. And um, I got you know the compilation "Cry Now, Cry Later." Ever heard that? No. You should check it out, man. It's like all the uh, it's like the first Crom recordings, "Despise You," "Excruciating Terrors" on it. Fear Factory when they were Factoria de Amigo, they have like a death metal song that's fucking killer. Uh, it's an amazing compilation. It's probably my favorite one. Um, but basically, I take that. And I just try and put them all into one song, and then that's Brain Pan. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, it's definitely on my radar now. Uh, what can we expect for future releases, and where can I buy the old ones, like Turn On, Tune In, Drop Dead? Turn In, Drop Dead, you can probably get out off the band camp. It's probably the best bet. But um, I think you can also find that. I don't know what else you can find that, to be honest. The band camp is definitely 100% the best bet. We, we still have some copies, I'm pretty sure. Uh, in terms of new stuff, we have a split that we're working on. Really excited about. I'm not entirely sure if I can talk about it, so I'm just going to play it on the safe side. Um, and then we have some other recordings that are left over, and we're starting to write too. I think we're going to go to LP number two soon. But we've got like three, four new songs that I think we're going to be on the uh, next LP. But our one split is already done, recorded. I think it's going to get mastered soon. But we'll see what happens. There was that fire right before the virus thing, so who knows when it comes out. Yeah, I heard about that. It's kind of going to be rough for some independent record labels for a while. Well, I'm definitely excited to hear it. Um, it's definitely some awesome material. So you're in yet another fast one called Secular Media. Yeah. Give me a quick history of that band. Um, at the time, it was it's basically it was Narrow Grave without um, – John, because John was living in Richmond, and at the time, uh, Alex, who was in that band Crucial Rip, was living up in Fairfax, Virginia, and teaching, and he was just around, he joined up with Narrow Grave, and we were like, or Hassan actually said, like, hey, do you guys want to play a show? I was like, well, John can't make it up, so we'll just form a band. <laughs> so, oh, shit. At the time, yeah, it was me, my roommate, Demir, who's in Genocide Pact and uh, Perpetuated, we were just like, do you want to just, like, play Cryptic Slaughter? And like just shred the shit out of it. Like we'll just do pull out all our hardest tricks at like 400 BPM or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, just to kind of like uh, do that as fast as we could. We were writing more thrash, kind of punkier thrash stuff, which we were already doing with a uh, narrow grave. So it was an easy transition. And then like each song's like a minute long. Alice was a really good drummer. Now Paul's taking over since Alex moved back to Richmond. Uh, Paul from Two More than that is. And they're all spectacular drummers spectacular musicians so we can kind of pump those songs out whenever we feel like it i feel bad that we're not as active as we used to be but that might change so we'll see well um this is probably the least familiar project of yours that i'm that i'm just i'm just checking out your band camp earlier and i really love the art for consume beyond hunger who's the artist for that this guy uh, john mayo my buddies in the band uh, choking sands who actually our singer jordo play this bass for now uh they put us on they put me onto him and it's like total are you familiar with cause for alarm by agnostic front right yeah it's total worshiping that stuff we just really wanted bright colors because two more is like all black and white brain pan is for the most part every other band i'm in is just like stark bleak i was like look dude let's just do crazy colors let's just go some like old school thrash crossover style shit so and he knocked it out of the park, man. And that was, he's cheap, he's fast. Everyone who has a band should just find, uh, he's, I believe he goes by Mayor Mayo. Let me double check real quick uh, on Instagram. But if you talk to him through that, then he'll hook you up real good. It's not exactly like it, but it reminds me of the cover of Toxic Think This. That's what we basically had uh, Cause for Alarm meets Think This by Toxic. Yeah. So, we love that record too. But, hell yeah, awesome record. So would you say, the subject matter of secular media is sort of more political in nature? It's more political because we're, I think most of my bands are relatively political. Um, uh, that one's more, again, more Jordo's thing. I like to have the vocalists 
speak for themselves on that stuff, but I can speak to, he's pretty clear, I think, in a lot of the stuff that we're trying to touch upon when that happens. And, you know, just being aware of your surroundings in like today's political climate, if you're not upset at some direction, it's probably something going on with you or you're not paying attention. Yeah, this is <laughs> not paying attention. Right. <laughs> so the two so, releases, you literally just put out this one. Um, I noticed <laughs> that they're three years apart. Is this more of a side project for you guys? Yeah, definitely. Like, if, since it started, it was like, literally, Hassan was like, hey, can you guys play this show? We're like, we'll start a band just so we can play it. We just want to help you out. Fuck and it's yeah. easy. <laughs> so it's kind of been like that the whole time. Where I'm like, hey, you want to do Psycho Beauty today? Like, eh, nah. Or then, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? And like I said, like, everyone is monumentally... Well, like, we're good at what we do, I guess. Because Demir is an amazing guitarist. Paul's an amazing drummer. And Jordo just always has lyrics on deck and stamina up the ass. So we can just, like, kind of pump out a song. Of course, we write them down the same way that, like, two more than write down songs. I think we probably have, like, between me and Demir, who write the same way, pretty much. We have like 60, roughly, secular media tracks, but you know, we don't need, we barely practice, so. I gotcha. So, what are the other members' main bands? Oh, uh, so right now, I think Jordo, the singer, is playing bass in Choking Sands, who I can't recommend enough. They fucking rule for like integrity style, heavy, hardcore. Um, then Paul is in Perpetuated and Two Morton. And Demir is in Perpetuated and Genocide Pact, and Genocide Pact being Genocide Pact is probably his main band, I, I would say. Um, and then me. So <laughs> with my uh, eight other projects or whatever I'm up to nowadays. <laughs> right on. And they're all awesome. Um, what mm -hmm. drives you as a musician and a promoter? Like what motivates this busy lifestyle for you? I like staying busy, to be honest. If I, if I find myself sitting in a room with, like, nothing happening for, like, more than 20 minutes, I'll start to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, I like I like keeping busy. I always have these ideas. Like, I always want to start these new bands, new projects, and explore what makes that sound that sound. Like, so, like, a sludge band versus a death metal band versus power violence, you know, what makes it specific. And I don't want to you know, kind of taint any of my other bands necessarily. It feels like Two Morton has a sound. So I'm not going to all of a sudden write a secular media song for Two Morton, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, now that makes perfect sense. And I have the means to do it. Like, my folks have been amazing in that all of our gear between all of my bands has, like, kind of ended up in their basement. So that's where we practice. <laughs> and, like, we, like it's my parents' basement. So if I go grab some food from their fridge, one day in between jobs and I can just go down and like write nine riffs and go to work again, come back, whatever. You know, and they don't, they really don't seem to care about like all the noise I make. So it's pretty awesome. That's awesome, man. Uh, when you aren't working on music, what do you do in your downtime? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just like, I uh, spend time with my girlfriend. Um, I was doing something. I don't remember playing video games probably. Watching TV, watching movies, yeah. What video Cooking. games are you into lately? Oh, uh, right. Well, since this whole quarantine thing happened, we just got PSN online just to like make work with what we got. So a lot of Red Dead online. Um, I used to love Warhammer a lot, so I just got this game Vermintide. I mean, I used to collect it and paint it and shit, but now I can't afford that. So uh, there's this they have this uh, PlayStation game Vermintide which is basically the Warhammer world, but, like, first person, uh, Left 4 Dead style, actually. Oh, shit. So, yeah, you basically, you have, like, a giant Warhammer, and you're just, like, crushing rat people and, like, fighting demons and shit. So, it's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right up my alley, and I, I think we all have plenty of downtime lately. Well, that's all I got. Um, thank you so much for being a part of our channel. Thank you for, like, putting, posting this up. This is awesome, by the way. Like, I love when people get creative with how to support each other and i think this is a really good way to do it and props for taking the initiative yeah i wish we could do it in person but uh the phone interviews have been going pretty good i'm starting to call them the virus interviews no that's good i like it cool man so thanks for coming on um if you guys are listening be sure to check out tomb warden split with hallucination realized brain pan turn on tune in drop dead and secular media consume beyond hunger it's all on Bandcamp. Uh, leave us a comment on how we did or a suggestion. And don't forget to subscribe. See you all next time.